Welcome to Why Is This Good, a podcast by the Naples Writers Workshop. I'm Christine, and I'm here with John. Hey, John. Hello. John, it's your turn. Why don't you tell us what you picked? I picked the story, The Yellow Wallpaper by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. All right. And you got a section you want to read for us? I do. I don't know why I should write this. I don't want to. I don't feel able. And I know John would think it absurd, but I must say what I feel and think in some way. It is such a relief. But the effort is getting to be greater than the relief. Half the time now I am awfully lazy and lie down ever so much. John says I mustn't lose my strength and has me take cod liver oil and lots of tonics and things to say nothing of ale and wine and rare meat. Dear John, he loves me very dearly and hates to have me sick. I tried to have a real earnest reasonable talk with him the other day and tell him how I wish he would let me go and make a visit to cousin Henry and Julia. But he said I wasn't able to go nor able to stand it after I got there. And I did not make out a very good case for myself for I was crying before I had finished. It is getting to be a great effort for me to think straight. Just this nervous weakness, I suppose. And dear John gathered me up in his arms and just carried me upstairs and laid me on the bed and sat by me and read to me till it tired my head. He said I was his darling and his comfort and all he had and that I must take care of myself for his sake and keep well. He says no one but myself can help me out of it, that I must use my will and self-control and not let any silly fancies run away with me. There's one comfort. The baby is well and happy and does not have to occupy by this nursery with the horrid wallpaper. If we had not used it, that blessed child would have. What a fortunate escape. Why, I wouldn't have a child of mine, an impressionable little thing, live in such a room for worlds. I never thought of it before, but it is lucky that John kept me here after all. I can stand it so much easier than a baby, you see. Of course, I never mention it to them anymore. I am too wise, but I keep watch of it all the same. There are things in that paper that nobody knows but me, or ever will. Behind that outside pattern, the dim shapes get clearer every day. It is always the same shape, only very numerous. And it is like a woman stooping down and creeping about behind that pattern. I don't like it a bit. I wonder, I begin to think, I wish John would take me away from here. Dun, dun, dun. (laughs) So why'd you pick this? Well, the first reason it's a classic story. Everybody's encountered it or read it or about to read it. But um, the second reason I was doing um, some comments for revision and uh, happened to read a usage note that quoted Charlotte Perkins Gilman. And I thought, oh yeah, we should do the uh, yellow wallpaper story. And so I pulled it off the shelf and said, let's do this one. Yeah, I definitely read it recently for the first time. And it was definitely a result of our group. I don't know if it, we talked about it on the podcast or in our workshop, but somebody had mentioned that this was a classic and I've never read it. <laughs> and I finally read it. So um, this was my second time reading it. But like I said, it's been a while and um, it's creepy. Yeah. Like for so many reasons. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a happy story. No, absolutely. So what do you like about it? Well, I like the way it develops. I like the the creepiness of it. And just, you know, it's kind of like um, the Edgar Allan Poe that we did, um, Telltale Heart, you know, yes. where you just see somebody going crazy over time. And this right. is the same thing. I mean, there's social issues behind it and all that kind of stuff. But um, I just like that as far as a narrative, seeing somebody descend into madness, I guess. It's an interesting thing to witness. Yeah, I was thinking about the Telltale Heart just because we read it on the podcast as well. So we've talked about stories that are, you know, kind of, older maybe in their time they were truly spooky but now it takes some real gore for folks <laughs> to get a real scare like in theaters and things but stories like this are good examples of like that original narrative style and like you said how you get to as the reader or viewer observe the descent into madness it's not quick it's not obvious especially when it's a story told this way where it's first person diary entries so we don't know that she's the unreliable narrator until it's like a little too late and then you have to like constantly reframe your interpretation of what she's telling you Mm -hmm. which is like similarly unsettling for the reader right you're constantly getting knocked off balance in terms of what you can believe and then how you understand the next thing and the next thing and then pretty soon you're kind of on board with the idea that the wallpaper's alive because (laughs) (laughs) that's right we don't know anymore and we're looking over our shoulders we don't know if the husband's right or wrong or this like nanny friend of hers you know all of a sudden like you lose your footing at some point in the story and that unhinged kind of like off balance feeling is what's also spooky yeah it's also obviously 
the element of how women were treated back in the 19th century. And it's like, you know, she's in there believing that she's suffering from this thing, but the treatment for it is helping exacerbate it or cause it. So you're kind of struggling against this, like, no, no, you're, right. you're not getting better. You're getting worse. You need to right. get out of there. Yeah. I mean, like I'm reading this and applying 21st century terms to the concept, right? I'm thinking to myself, she's being gaslit. And that's not a word that they had back then. That was just like standard treatment. And uh, I had to read some kind of criticism, not really criticism. It's more just like all these look back pieces talking about how this is a story that has to stood the test of time, like for its content, but also for what it was commenting on. And then it gave a lot of context for, like you said, the, the time. And I think this was like first published in like 1890. I wrote it down. 1892 is when it first appeared in like a magazine. And it was hailed as like some of the early feminist literature because she's basically telling you a horror story, but this is a real situation where men kept their wives and yeah, you were told to do things and you weren't believed about your health then and now. That's right. It's still a problem. It's still a problem, uh, but this is so much more obvious, right? There's probably something too to be said about the passage of time in terms of us reading this more than 100 years later, like 130, and realizing really early on that this is going to be her demise because she's not being listened to. And uh, we probably all have a modern day story about that when it comes to our health, right? You have these symptoms and maybe it's mental health. I mean, yeah, look, look at how we're talking about mental health now versus 20 years ago. To be told repeatedly that people who aren't you but who are supposed to care about you have your best interest in mind and know better than you do. Sometimes that's true, right? But uh, in a situation like this, it's absolutely not. And so she, it seems at some point starts to kind of drive herself mad. Yeah, there's uh, definitely um, the way that women were conceived of, like the way that the assumptions made about women's mental life is such back in the 19th century. It's scary right. to think that people, human beings are actually treated that way or thought of that way. Right. But yeah, and I guess Yes, in the grand scheme of things, we really haven't come that far from that. We, we, <laughs> we like to think like, oh man, that would be awful to live like that. But right. walk into a hospital today and no one's going to listen to you. So Yeah. So in a story like this, where maybe we fancy ourselves a little more privy to her situation than she is as she's writing it. Like I said, I think it still achieves that spookiness because now we see where it is going. We know that she's not safe. So you're not reading it and being spooked alongside her. You're you're watching her and hoping against hope that she gets out of it. But we see, you know, like she just falls into this and she can't get out. And it's like too late by the time they're supposed to be moving moving out of the house. Yeah, so it's less horror than it is uh sad. <laughs> <laughs> it is it is sad. It is definitely that. <laughs> But you can see, too, why this is ripe for modern day interpretations like that keep it strictly in the vein of horror, where you spend a lot of time watching the wallpaper move and kind of less time on the political commentary. Yes. So there's still something horror at the heart that's great. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That mental breakdown is is horrifying, right? And the fact that it's told in the first person diary entries, you know, you get that kind of double vision where you're seeing things through her eyes, but also you understand that she's not seeing things accurately. Right. You kind of reinterpret like, what is she really seeing? It's like, oh, she's going crazy. That's what's happening. This room really did it to her. I like the section that you read because I think it's the first time that I realized that there was a child in the picture because she just kind of offhanded makes the mention of the nursery and then says something about like, oh, well, at least the baby. So then obviously a lot of the commentary that you read about this story now talks about how, I mean, even until recently, we didn't have a name for postpartum depression depression and the idea that right after giving birth you're totally out of whack and yeah probably feeling crazy and those feelings are dismissed because the focus is really on the baby right and how could you not be happy and you have a child like what's wrong with you right instead of like this is like a natural result of what hormones being out of whack or whatever it is but yeah so i read a lot about that too and it's like even scarier to think that she doesn't necessarily have some random mental health problem this That's could true. very well be a direct result of what just happened but nobody cares about that either because right like when a woman's pregnant it's all about the baby so here she is like oh i'm so happy the baby isn't in this room going crazy it's like well the baby would be fine in that room uh it's not the room that's the problem <laughs> 
Well, to talk about craft, that was kind of what I zeroed in on this idea that it was told in diary entries. What do you think of that? Did you enjoy that? Oh yeah, absolutely. That was, that's also what I was thinking of as far as like, like a takeaway. What my takeaway yeah, is going to sure. be about first person, but you know, when you read about first, third person, usually the, uh, the style guides, the advice guides for fiction are like, yeah, there's three ways to tell a story. First person limited, first person, or I'm sorry, third person limited, third person omniscient and first person. And some people might throw in second person's use, but don't do it. And some people might say third person omniscient is is old and nobody should do it. And some people might say, choose your own adventure, but only goosebumps. That's right. Yeah, there's all kinds of things that just don't get included in that. And one of them is the many different ways you can do first person. You know, this is like you said, like a like a written diary. You know, it's, she actually refers to herself as writing. It's like, I have yes. to sneak these words down, but I have right. to write them down because I have to share what's going on. Right. Whereas on, another story, you know, like uh, that story we did, Goodbye and Good Luck. Oh, yeah. Grace Paley. And that story, it's not being written down. It's just being spoken. It's like a monologue. And yes. even, even if it is a dialogue, we don't don't get the other side of it. We don't get to hear what her interlocutor is saying back or niece or something, you know, so that's another way to do first person. Another way to do third person is just internal thoughts and impressions, you know, like uh, Tilly Olson, I stand here ironing is like that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, she gets a phone call and it's just her thought process. It's kind of literally in some cases. So the Tilly Olson story is literally like what she is thinking, like in words and sentences in her head. So there's so many different things you can do with it. And then each one of those brings different things to what you can accomplish and what, what you're limited to, you know, like a journal entry one, you can't have a first person narrator write about their own death because then there's no, how do they write it? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Asian for the writing. Whereas a first person narrator, just you're getting, if you're getting like present tense impressions from them, you could have them experience a death on the page. You don't have to worry about how they wrote it. Right. Sure. And there's just various things like that, that fall out of it. So I, this story made me think about what a complicated mess first person can be. Yes. It's not just using I as the pronoun. Right. Well, to add to that, I hate diary entries. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the reason I do is because like you mentioned running into difficulty in first person and imagining your death. What I get tripped up on when I read stories like this is especially kind of the last scene where she's telling yeah. us what's happening. It's almost as if she's telling us in present tense that this is unfolding. It's like the final descent is when she really goes off the handle and she's found in her room pacing. She's we're to believe that she's mentally like probably irreparable at this point right and still i have this vision of her sneaking her diary around and writing and i'm thinking to myself as the reader how how when did she write this is she writing this after the fact if she wrote it after the fact then why is she talking about treatment or what happened after this you know i get tripped up on like the logistics of telling something like this unfolding when the whole point of a diary is like reflecting on what happened yes you don't write a diary as something's happening you pull it out at the end of the day, whatever, and you reflect kind of. So that's where I get annoyed. <laughs> but it's because I'm like thinking too critically about it. Yeah, that it's tricky. It, yeah, I think it is because I think it's probably really easy to kind of fall into a style of writing that lends some kind of immediacy to it when you have to really think about when you're writing a diary, maybe you write in your diary throughout the day. So it's easier to be like, just now so-and-so walked up you know, into my room and said this versus I've been thinking about about it for a week and this is how I <laughs> right. you know sanitized my experience but that's what I get tripped up on I do like I was thinking obviously this week I posted something in the Facebook group which you should all join about how the diary of Anne Frank was published like 74 years ago this month wow. so yeah and this is not a good example because that's a totally different genre, right? Uh, yeah. It was a diary and it was kind of just published. It wasn't thought of as, you know, telling a story in the traditional sense as fiction. But I enjoy reading things that way where you are getting slices of life and you are getting like kind of the knee jerk reaction. And then you do come away with some overarching theme for that person's life. And I think when people try to mimic a style like that, you know, where if Anne Frank was a work of fiction, we would really play up certain aspects, right? We would try to make it seem natural. We would add the the weird side stories and the internal monologues that have nothing to do with the theme, but we would stretch the main theme and it would get like 
increasingly complicated to make it seem like more and more natural. I like when it's just a real diary or like when it's letters. There's this book that I just ordered actually, and it's supposedly uh, love letters between soldiers in the war. And like one was gay. Well, they were both gay, but like they're writing letters to each other and it's not overt what their relationship was, but you're to glean that as a modern day reader and it's real correspondence. So stuff like that, I'm to- I totally love the real stuff. And then I get just like so caught up in, well, is this authentic? Is this real? Could this have happened that, you know, that's just me. Like I have the same problem when I watch movies based on true stories. <laughs> it's like, well, what about this? Uh, what, did they actually say it this way? Cause this is really good. But if it didn't really happen, I don't know. That's like kind of a tangent, but that's what I was thinking toward the end of this. I was like, okay, if I had to write a story that I've written in the past, maybe third person, and I wanted to turn it into dialogue diary entries. Wow, that is complicated (laughs) to kind of have that character be reflecting on what happened and telling you what happened. It also is interesting always, I think, going back to Anne Frank, there's a lot of speculation in terms of like who she was addressing her entries to. So I think in this one, I'm like, who is this woman addressing these entries to? Because to me, she seems like the kind of person that has no one to talk to or else something like this might not so easily happen to her. So it's for herself, I imagine. And then it just becomes interesting to think about the whole exercise. Yeah. Yeah. You you hit on all the complications of all <laughs> that. I was thinking of uh, epistolary works are also the same way, you know, like letters are basically diary entries entries that are addressed to a person and that you right. post. But I think fiction is usually, I don't want to say best, but it's most recognizable when it's an immediate scene and yes. things are happening and people are reacting. Right. And that is not what a dire entry is ever. A dire entry, like right. you said, is always a reflection on something. So no matter right. like the ending of this is, you know, she's running around the room pretending to be the woman behind the wallpaper and like stepping over her husband who has fainted on the floor. And he's, she's like, now why? Why should that man have fainted? But he did. And right across my path by the wall so that I had to creep over him every time. And you were left with her just running around in the circle. But you're yeah. right. We have to think she went at some point. That scene happened the day they left that house. So was it like a week right. later back home and she's like writing it out? Like, oh yeah, right. let me try to remember what it was like to be crazy now that I've recovered yeah. and just put myself in that frame of mind again. I think, you know, for a story like this, you kind of have to suspend belief. Yeah, you kind of have to suspend your critique in some respect. Right. And you see that happen. I, just, I can't think of a good example right now, but I know that it happens in other formats too. Usually when it, whenever the writing has an occasion to it, like in a conversation or in a letter or in, in a diary, sure, there are going to be those moments when um, there are scenes that are playing out that want to and need to feel immediate. But if you allow yourself to remember this was written in a letter or a diary, they can't. Right. right. <laughs> There's some, there was a book, uh, it was called The Historian, which um, at the time was like the largest advance ever given to a writer. Oh, wow. And it's all letters and various written out things. But the story starts off with like, I'm writing this letter about, or I'm writing this, these notes about this. And then I found a letter. Let's go to the letter. And then the letter starts and it's like in a different person's voice. And halfway through that letter, he finds something buried in a book and he has to like quote that. And it's a different letter. And it just goes like that. It's like chaining letters off of letters. It's uh, really cool the way it's put together. But you know, you have to, you think, all right, I'm going to write a letter in which I include another letter in which I include another letter. It just doesn't make sense. It's interesting. There's something too about letters that's a little bit different than diary entries because the story can be happening on the page. The story is in the letters. Yes. Like you don't have occasion for the story except that these two people are interacting through correspondence. Whereas a diary is like your own personal exercise. And so then I get really meta about what is the point? Who would read it? When did you write it? Letters, I think, are just as tricky, but I think it's probably easier to kind of think of ways that you would summarize, for example, what happened that month for a character. And then for there to be not just reflection on what's happening in the world outside the letters, but something happening between the characters as they write. Yeah, absolutely. Like the the classic one would be love letters, right? There's a relationship that's building. Right. And they're hinting at things and they're saying things directly to each other that they don't get to say in person. Yeah. So 
I don't know that I would suggest that people do it for an entire story, but like maybe more to your more recent example of that book, kind of the Russian nesting dolls, like maybe you have a letter or maybe you have occasional diary entries. Dracula was all letters. The whole, the whole oh story of gosh. Dracula was epistolary. Yeah, very long. And do you see what we've reduced it to? The vampire, because we know that that was the only good part, not the letters. <laughs> I haven't read it. I don't know. The one, oh, who directed it? But it had uh, Gary Oldman and uh, Keanu Reeves from like the early 90s. <sighs> It's called Bram Stoker's Dracula. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was kind of presented in almost an epistolary. That, like each of the characters would speak like a voiceover as if they're reading a letter or narrating something. It was um, it wasn't a bad movie. It was pretty good, <laughs> but it, it held on um, to that aspect of the story. Is what I'm what I should say. Yeah. Okay. Occasionally, a Hollywood director will <laughs> decide to keep something that was integral to the book. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Well, what else do you like about this? Or do you have takeaways? Uh, I think I'm ready for the takeaways. Sure. My takeaway was basically what I said about first person. It's like, there's a difference between like occasioned first person and non-occasioned first person, like where the first person is, I'm having a conversation, I'm writing a letter, I'm writing a diary entry or a journal entry or whatever it is. It's tied to a specific concrete action in the world versus non-occasioned, I would think would be something where it's just like my thought processes, they can be happening anytime. I mean, they're, they're tied to the story, obviously, but they're not, they don't require me to be alive to write them down, right? Yeah. So I think the difference between those two things is just the first division. And then within each of those sets, you have all kinds of other divisions that can come through. So yeah, my takeaway is just basically how complicated first person can be and the potential of it as a storytelling mode is really powerful. Oh yeah, for sure. I know for sure that I can get spun up about who is this narrator talking to and why. Right. I can do that for like any book that I've ever read. I just read one everyone else has already read called called, you know, Never Let Me Go by the, he's British, but I think his background, he's either from like Japan or I forget his name, but it's called Never Let Me Go. And it's basically like first person. Let me tell you the story of my life. Let me back up. Oh, don't forget. Let me tell you this. And it's not really like directly talking to the narrator, but, or to the reader, but I can do that with any book and think to myself, who is she writing this to? Who does she think I am? You know? And if I think too hard about it, I'll pull myself out of the moment, which is not the point. So when we said suspend belief to enjoy something like this, it's not just so you can enjoy that last scene. It's also because if you think too hard about it, (laughs) stories are all weird and we're just trying to stick with the ones that speak to us so that we can enter that, you know, fictitious dream state that we all are striving after. So don't overthink it because every time I picked up that book and took a break, I had to tell my brain to shut up and just get back into it, you know? And there'd be times where I'd pull myself out of it, just like overthinking it. Uh-huh, yeah. My point is you can do it with anything. It's not just diaries. The potential's there, I think, for any book. Oh, yeah. Even like um, what I was just calling unoccasioned first person where you don't see the, the narrator writing it down. There's no reason to think yeah. that they really did write it down. It's first person. You kind of project a lot onto a first person narrator. So you do have to remind yourself sometimes that it's okay if you can't see the pen in their hand. Right. Yeah. The author of Never Let Me Go is Kazo Ishiguro. He wrote that other one. Oh, The Remains of the Day. Oh. Yeah. It's the same guy. Anyway, my takeaway would be a lot less about this kind of diary stuff. Although I think it's cool to add this kind of element every once in a while, just the way that you would maybe in real life discover someone's diary and like sneak a peek or like find an old letter. Oh, there's something so exciting about reading someone's writing that they didn't want to be read. (laughs) So I think even coming across it in fiction, if it's invented, is like really cool. So go ahead and try that. But my main takeaway would be more in line with the fact that this story, like we spent a lot of time on at the beginning, has a lot of staying power. And it's because it's like centered around some kind of political statement in a way or cultural statement of the time. And it's told through a lens of a particular genre. And I think horror is especially effective. So we've seen this a lot lately in film. I'm thinking of the movie Get Out. And if you've seen some of these movies these days, they're telling horror. But if you think for more than half a second, 
second or read any review, you'll realize very quickly that it's commentary and that the real issue that they're talking about is much scarier. So I'm thinking too of like Handmaid's Tale, which we're currently watching on Hulu. And I don't know exactly why she wrote the book in the first place, but you can make so many parallels and they did when the first season of the show came out to what's happening these days with, uh, you know, abortion and birth control and how we regulate women and their pregnancies. And then to come up with this like futuristic dystopian novel where America has seceded from the rest of America and they're forcing women to give birth to children and then keeping them as slaves. It's terrifying. But the point is kind of that the author at some point has been able to envision this because that's what they think might currently be happening. So if you can think of something truly horrific in the modern day climate, you might have to really think (laughs) maybe you can come up with a way though to like make commentary. And I think horror is especially good for this kind of thing because you'll be so kind of caught up in what's happening. This is terrifying. Wow. It's so like messed up and what's going on in this world. Or if it's a movie, you'll be so caught up in like the jump scares and the thrill and the bombs that, you know, the message might be kind of neatly tucked in there, but the critics will spot it right away and you will be elevated to, you know, staying power among the masses. And then in 200 years, when people are telepathically having podcasts, they'll say, oh my God, this story was written 200 years ago and they were so right. Look what's happening now. I can't believe it's still culturally relevant. And also it was written in first person diary entries. I find myself like really gravitating toward that kind of content these days. And it's cool. It's like an an element of escapism almost, right? I'd rather not read about Hobby Lobby and birth control, but I will watch Handmaid's Tale like every Wednesday. And just marvel at that because that seems easier so yeah I think that's a cool trick. No, that's good. That's good. And that's put it in as a short story. Isn't that one of the ways that we determined to get into the New Yorker? Yes. To make it current. And <laughs> Oh, it has to be current. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Long. So long. That's right. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, guys. If you enjoyed this episode, consider subscribing to our monthly newsletter at our website, NaplesWritersWorkshop.com. And for daily writing tips, industry news, and great short fiction, join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash Naples Writers Workshop.